On this episode of Between Two Bears, we talk to BJ Watling. Watling retired from cricket in June after winning the World Test Championship as arguably New Zealand's greatest ever wicketkeeper batsman in Test cricket. He has scored more runs than any other Kiwi keeper with a better average and the most dismissals. Watling played 75 Tests for the Black Caps and 28 ODIs across 11 years. In this episode, we talk about his perfect career arc, his short-form cricket regrets, what happened in the changing room after the WTC win, what happened when an ND coach tried to stop him from smoking, what he talked about in between overs with Brendan McCullum during the epic 352-run partnership, and why he was Baz's favourite player, the toughest bowler he ever faced, and so much more. BJ is a humble, no-nonsense guy. He's one of the best to ever hold the gloves, and yet has zero ego attached. He's such a likeable character, this 90 minutes gives a real window into why every black cap of the modern era speaks so highly of him. This episode was sponsored by Goodwill Law, a top-rated regional law firm for clients seeking personalised private property and commercial legal services. Goodwill Law uses technology to remove archaic overheads and ensure its clients pay for value, not admin. Whether you are local or remote, Goodwill Law offers free in-person or online consultations as well as the ability to generate your own automated online fee estimate. Goodwill Law, making legal services simple. If you enjoy this episode, please share on social media. It's the quickest and easiest way to help us grow. Also, visit our website, betweentwobears.com, for show notes and links to support us on Patreon. A huge thanks to those already on board. BJ Watling, welcome to Between Two Beers. Thanks for having me, boys. Excited to have you. Fresh from day three of the Black Caps Mace Tour, is that right? Tauranga this morning, Hamilton Boys High this afternoon? Yep, yep. Um, had a little stint in Auckland on Monday for a, a function that evening, and then had Tuesday off, which is nice, and, and a full day today in Tauranga and, and Hamilton, which was, yeah, I mean, it was, it was exciting to see all the fans and Get the get the trophy out, and, and you could sort of see the appreciation in, in some people's faces. So it was pretty cool. I haven't spoken to you in about twenty years. We're going to get to that soon. But the research I've been doing suggests you're quite a sort of a laid back character. Perhaps doesn't search for the limelight. Do these sort of celebration tours? How do you feel about them? Are you are you okay with it? I uh, never had one. So, <laughs> yeah. It is a it's first and last probably, but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I think it's great because I mean, I mean, the fans come to watch here, um, and you've had all the support for a long period of time, and it's nice to obviously win it, and it's nice to feel the recognition. But um, yeah, I mean, I do like to just keep it reasonably low key. So, what was the scene today? There was a couple of black caps signing autographs, celebrating the trophy. Was that? Just... Yeah, yeah. I mean, we went to Tarrant Intermediate, and they they did an awesome haka to lead us in. Um, we had a bit of a chat, I asked some questions, so there's there a bit of interaction going on and then, yeah, we had to fly through a few autographs and, and um, photos at the same time. So, yeah, I think, yeah, I enjoy going to Boys High, especially today. Um, it was pretty cool to go back to my old stomping ground and see Coogs there and, and Mitchell Sattner today got a um, got awarded his medal because he wasn't a part of the, the actual 15. Um, so it was pretty cool. They made it quite special. and. Hopefully the fans got something out of it. Nice. We're going to touch on a lot of that boys' high stuff to start with. Shay, uh, the way we start these episodes, BJ, is we explain how we know BJ Watling. Shay, have you met BJ before? He's just been an email address until tonight. Um, first time that we've actually met. I was kind of hoping that you'd bring the mace, but hey, never mind. Um, <laughs> I'm sure I'll catch it on the tour later on. Um, but you've got a bit of a closer link, Stephen, almost a, a claim to fame. Maybe your second claim to fame at the moment with the Olympics going on. Yeah. Um, I think this is the first time I think I've seen BJ in 20 years. Do you think? Not seen him at all. I mean, he has been playing international cricket. First time I've spoken to BJ. Gotcha. In, in 20 years. Yeah, so I've got two claim to fame. One of them is uh, when I played for Waikato United as a striker, Chris Wood was on the bench. So I say, oh, because I was a starting striker ahead of Chris Wood. The caveat there, which I often don't say, is that Chris was about 12 years old at the time. <laughs> he was a man-child um, just at the beginning. And the other claim to fame is that when I was in fourth form, uh, BJ Watling was in my cricket team, and I was the wicketkeeper 
and the preferred glovesman. Now, the caveat there is that my dad was the coach. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I, I, we sort of, uh, I think you were a year younger than me at school. We, yeah, we were acquaintances. I don't think we were particularly close, but um, excited to catch up on a lot of lost time. Do you remember? I mean, that's obviously a very big memory for me in my cricket career. Do you remember that team? Are we talking like 1999? Yeah. First year. Was that, was that your first year at Boys High? Yeah, I, I mean, I do remember playing for the Colts. Um, in my first term of year nine, and the faces in <laughs> the Colts, yeah, and they're, they're not so vivid. <laughs> was there an Anton Devsic in that team? Are we Anton Devsic was in the team. I, I actually spoke to my dad asking for his recollections of that period because he coached the team third and fourth form. I said, what did you remember of BJ? And he said, well, to be honest, BJ was a bit of a frustrating player because he was so technically good, he would never get out, but he was so tiny, he didn't get many runs. So he would just sort of anchor the innings and he'd get he'd, he'd bat through the whole innings and he'd get about 14 runs. And I sort of said, was that difficult for you as a coach, Bruce? Did you struggle with BJ as a player? He's like, no, 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 don't say that. Um, but I did have a question. Do you remember Bruce Holloway as your coach? I do, yeah, and I definitely... It's not massive, but I do remember Bruce Holloway when you say the name. I've definitely like I act like now, um, but not yeah. I'm I not don't. Sure. I can't remember any advice to be honest. Yeah. He didn't tell me to pick up the strike rate, which would have been nice, or did he? Well, I don't think yeah. he would. I don't think he would have. I don't think he would have. <laughs> he was too busy making sure Stephen was crouched down behind the uh, stumps by all accounts. Yeah, but uh, uh, in that high school phase, um, was there a period where you realised you were good? Like, do you remember the earliest time when you were like, fuck, I've kind of I've kind of got the hang of this. Why the fuck is Holloway fourth? keeping stumps <laughs> ahead of me? As a, as a batsman and a wicketkeeper? Um, I, yeah, it's hard to pick out a point. Um, I think by sixth form, I sort of realised that there was something there. Um, I mean, we were playing pretty good cricket in the first 11, winning games, uh, getting to Gillette Cup and... And so by then, maybe, um, yeah, under 14s ND, making that sort of side, you start to realise, yeah, I'm okay at this and can potentially keep going. But there's hiccups along the way. I remember not making the ND under 19s when I was 17 and missed one year there, um, which was disappointing and I didn't enjoy that at all. But it, it pushed me to try and get better and make it for the last year of under 19s. Looking at the um, the record books, so Hamilton Boys High have won the Gillette Cup three times. 2002 and 2003, they won it back to back. Were you part of both of those teams? Yep, yep. So sixth form won it for the first time and then seventh, seventh form. form yeah. What do you remember about that group? Yeah, I mean, massively fond memories. Um, some of our good mates, they're still there now, Anton, Keir Bettley, Cameron Waite was involved, the likes of Bryce Turner, uh, Daniel Bortwood for one of the years. Um, so, I mean, a lot of these guys are still, I'm still in touch with um, and catch up regularly for a beer. And, yeah, I mean, those are the days. I, I, I mean, I love playing those those two tournaments. They were, they were right up there and I've got, yeah, a lot of memories about them. Was it at that stage where the boys' high first eleven started playing senior club cricket as well? Was that kind yeah, of around that time? It, but yeah, yeah, we we started in the. I think it was senior A back then, and now they might be in the the Premier right. Team A. But yeah, we started playing senior A, and we got a few lessons from the old boys, and got told how shit we were, and uh, they're going to knock our heads off, and a few more expletives. Last year, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was pretty rough back then. Because we. <laughs> um, in talking to Chris Kugelan, I think, who was your coach, um, sort of said that maybe you and Anton Devsic used to go down to Seddon Park and some of the senior bowlers would just be firing down at you. We're talking 130 clicks plus. Is that is that kind of your recollection of things as well, being a... Yep. Was it Leighton Hammond? Does that name ring about? Nah. He, he might have played a couple of games for ND and uh, left arm sort of quick and, yeah, we were in the Seddon Park indoor nets. And Kugi just, he basically says, yeah, go for them. And bounce him, York him, go for it. And yeah, I vividly remember that net session. I was like, holy shit. 
this is hard, this is bloody hard, and he was peppering us. Um, but we survived, there was a couple of bruises, but I think lessons like that when you're young are, are yeah, I mean, they're invaluable, aren't they? Because I've, I've never played. I love cricket, <laughs> yeah. but I was always terrified of the ball. I can't even imagine standing down the end of a strip with someone really flinging something at you that you don't really have a lot of time to react to. Is there that sense of just kind of fear, or are you thriving on it? How does that, what does that look like as a teenage kid? I, I used to love it. I, I enjoy challenges. Like it's, I enjoy driving myself to try and be the best player in the world. Um, and especially when you're young, you're just trying to get better and better and better. Um, and I did love it. I mean, there's, there's certainly moments where you're absolutely cacking yourself, going, fuck, I don't really, I'm not really enjoying this, but you're trying to figure out how can I achieve something here? How can I score some runs? How can I survive this spell? And um, I enjoyed the challenge. Sometimes uh, got ahead. Are those moments when you say, I'm not really enjoying it, is that across the board? Is that even is, is Kane Williamson experiencing those moments where fuck, he's really feeling uncomfortable out there, or is it is it a little bit different for for different players? It's hard to put words into someone else's mouth, but having chats with Kane, I, there's definitely. I mean, he definitely gets put under pressure, and everyone feels pressure differently. Um, I think he handles it. I mean, outstandingly well. He's the best batter in the world. Um, but you can certainly see times where he's under pressure and the bowlers are on top of him. And he's, but he's got this way of, I think he's just smart, eh? And he's smart in the way he goes about it and he figures out how he's going to get through a period. Um, and then he figures out how to score the runs at the end of it. So I think there's geniuses and then there's sort of us lower level guys that are just fighting away, trying our best. But <laughs> he just, he works it out quicker than most, I think. We're going to get into um, some of your, your incredible stats a little bit later, but the, the theme is you're a guy that bats for time. You're in there for a long period of time. You've got this incredible mentality that you're just going to see it through, no matter how tough the situation is. You're, you're not going to give your wicket away. Where does that come from? Is that a mentality that comes from somewhere, your South Africa or your upbringing? Or like, I mean, that's quite a different outlook than like an Anton Devsic who we had on the show who, who was very aggressive and it was his mindset to try to hit the thing over the fence you know given the, given the chance do you know can you pinpoint like where that came from yeah probably right probably early childhood I think in South Africa at that time it, it was sort of about defense first and then scoring runs and so that through my early years through boys high until I was about six form when I could get it off the block it was about just batting, and I hated getting out. And often I played in teams that weren't the greatest, and I don't mean any disrespect by it, but... He's not offended. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, sometimes... God, it was we, a good we, Colts team, PK. <laughs> God, so. We would just keep losing wickets, and and I never wanted to get out. I love batting. And so my goal was just, I'm just going to bat here and see how long I can take it. And sometimes we're playing 50 overs, and by the 30th over, we're eight down. So... I still had 20 hours to bat, and I may as well keep going. That was kind of my thought process. Um, but I tried to expand my game, especially when 2020 came in, one day it came in, and I certainly tried to evolve it. And those two formats, I think they definitely help in test cricket, if you can go back to your, your basics as well. Um, you can see T20 coming out in tests all the time now. I mean, the way hand plays. It's a little bit crazy for my liking, but I mean, you can see it getting brought in in the game evolving. Two characters I want to touch on before we move on. Anton Devsic, start with him. You came up together, same year at school, were you? Yep, yep. yep. Um, ND, the works. Um, how, how is that relationship? Because it seems like you're, you're such sort of chalk and cheese. Um, do you guys have a strong bond sort of away from the game? Is, is, it, is it something you've enjoyed over the last decade plus? Yeah, I mean, I'm great mates with Devi. Um, he's a he's a fiery bugger. He, I think he's always been fiery. I remember playing him in Gwyn Shield when we were about 12, 11, and I was from Tokara at the time. And he was this nuggety little, well, he was tiny little halfback, and he was just yabbering the whole time. And, and we were like 10 years old. I'm going, who the hell is this? What is going on here? And... Since then, I mean, I've, I've got to know him really well, and he's, I mean, he's a top bloke. He's, he's loyal, he's fiery, but 
I think it's all honesty and we have a great relationship. It might be completely different personalities, but I quite enjoy the, the energy he brings. Um, and I reckon I calm him down a bit too, so it, it's not a bad little combo there. Is it coincidence then that he's retired shortly after you've retired as well? Just so you can um, spend more time together. And... <laughs> <laughs> well, he's working 50 hours at the moment, so he might want to start playing again. <laughs> um, yeah, no, nah, no coincidence. We've all sort of, there's about five of us that went to the academy together. There's Daniel Flynn, Brad Wilson, Devi, uh, and Tiahu, who, who sort of started off. I mean, he's been gone for a while now, but yeah, all of us have sort of faded off. And it's, yeah, yeah it's the right time for me. And I think Devi's had a great run too. I mean, his career's been fantastic. Mm. The, the other character is Chris Kugline, who we sort of briefly mentioned before. Uh, I had a, a brief conversation with Chris in the build-up to this episode, and I think in 10 minutes I probably heard as many swear words as I have in the last calendar year. But he is an absolute beaut of a character and someone who we are planning on getting on the show later, for those listeners out there. Um, but describe your relationship with Chris. He was a, he was a coach, but a mentor, but more than that, did you live with him for a period? No, nah, I haven't lived with him. I'm, not sure, I'm not sure okay. I could live with Kirgi too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I imagine it'd be reasonably messy, and yeah, he wouldn't have many socks available, and like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> unorganised old Kirgi sometimes. But uh, I just, I, I don't know. For some reason, I think he relates to, to kids extremely well. Um, I'm not sure if I was fifth form or fourth form when he came along, but yeah, there was something about him that I was naturally drawn to. Um, and, and I love the way he, he looked about life and it often wasn't cricket chat, it was often about people and good people and trying to install sort of good values in, in his teams um, and, and I was, yeah, I related to, it, related to it straight away basically and yeah, some of his poems and quotes and inspirational stuff really, yeah, really got me and it's sort of stuck with me ever since. Am I right in thinking he's a man in the glass? Guy? Is yeah. that one of his, his go-to poems? Yeah, yeah, that'll be the one. Yeah, that's a good one. He knows, I don't know it off by heart, but yeah, I, I do read it every now and then and just... Yeah, we'll link, we'll link that one. That's one of my favourite ones. But it's actually impossible to talk about Cougs and cricket without reflecting on the time, and we'll link it in our, in our website, but the time that he was caught on Sky Sport throwing his accreditation over the fence to get someone in. What were your thoughts on that? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm pretty sure we were there playing and could see it on the TV go, oh, what's he up to there? He's just sort of meandering around the top of the stands, wasn't he? And then all of a sudden you just see this thing fly <laughs> over the fence. And like, oh, no, we know exactly what he's done too. And then the camera shoots off, doesn't it? But, yeah, I think he was trying to get a couple of the boys and a couple of his school boys getting the free period off and trying to get them into the game to watch it. And I mean, I love that story. He's, you know, he's doing something for the kids and... They might have had a pretty good day at the test, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Coogs is, yeah, like I said, he's a character. Um, one of the things I asked him is, you know, when BJ was was fifth, sixth, seventh form at Boys High, could you tell, I mean, you've coached a shitload of players, could you tell at that point that he would go on to have the career he ended up having? And he said... Oh, it's a fucking stupid question, mate. I don't think of things like that. <laughs> but uh, eventually he said, look, the thing I'll say about BJ is he had the best work ethic of any players I've played with. He said the mentality, the work ethic of the guy, going over and be of the, the mentality, it, it, he almost couldn't put it into words. It was just, just, he wanted to get it out there that you had the success that you had because of the way you worked, which is... A really great thing, I think, to hear. And I'm going to lead into what a few other people have said about you. Um, it might be a little bit difficult for you to hear this, these compliments, and I'm not sure everyone uh, enjoys it, but grab yourself a beer because I'm going to read what Brendan McCullum said about you on a podcast with a friend of the show, Dwayne Sweeney. I thought this was really good. He said, um, everyone respects his cricket. Skill-wise, he was a very good player, but his character, I think, is what he'll be best known for. The tougher the situation, the more BJ would stand up. It got to the point where we made jokes on the side that if we were dominating the game, there's no way BJ would score runs. He needs it tough. He's got that fighting spirit. He doesn't say a lot within the group, but when he talks, everyone listens. His style of leadership is leading by his calming presence and his simple methods. He's been a part of New Zealand when we were struggling, and he's been part of the lift to respect. To now, the part 
where they are world dominating, world beating international side. And that is married up to his career and that's no coincidence. But in typical BJ style, his characteristics will live for a long time within that New Zealand side. And then I was listening to Sen's radio, the new uh, sort of radio show, which kicked off a couple of weeks ago. So BJ, uh, sorry, not BJ, uh, Brendan and Izzy Dagg are the breakfast hosts and one of their first guests they had was Kane Williamson. So it was like a, a 10 minute slot and for about four minutes they talked about you. And this is what Kane said. He said, he's the guy that truly keeps the team honest. He doesn't say a lot, but he's such a huge leader within the group. If you're talking about buying into what's important to a team and the commitment to that, he epitomizes it. He sets the standard in his behavior and as a group and as a team, that is really the most important part to our environment. If you're ever off track, he's very quick to pull you back and he's had that role for such a long time. He'll be missed in a lot of ways. Now, like I said, it, it can be difficult hearing sort of such nice things said about yourself, but I just wonder now, having retired and reflecting on what you've achieved, hearing such incredible words from two of not only the best cricketers New Zealand seen, but two of the best captains New Zealand's ever seen. To say that stuff about you, does that does that get to you? Like, does that hit different? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you often don't. Yeah, I mean, you don't hear that those sort of words too often, eh? And um, it, it does mean a lot. Um, I think one of the things for me is I've always I've never enjoyed being judged. I don't know if anyone really does, but it comes part and parcel with playing cricket internationally and, and you, the eyes are on you the whole time. So I, I've never enjoyed that too much, that side of it. Um, but I've always wanted my teammates, wanted, I've wanted them to like me. And I guess hopefully I've done that naturally without changing who I am. And, and I'm pretty sure I haven't, but um, it's kind of something that I've, I want people to like me. I want to be a likable guy, and yeah, I mean, it's it's nice to to hear things like that from two good friends of mine, and I'm glad they respect me a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like that's not by the, that's not a plan that you've gone in to be this leader of the group. That happens organically over ten years of you just being a good cunt, basically, in the changing room, just being. Yeah such a good bloke and leading by example that just over time it just swells into this like incredible appreciation right you've been a real consistent part of that side for so long but also and i don't mean this disrespectfully like an unseen part of that side for so long as well like you're not you're not spoken about in terms of like the wicket takers or the all the the run scorers the prolific scorers but you're just this constant presence consistent presence and like stevie saying your teammates see that, and they they must genuinely love your company. Because in the in the video we saw as well before your retirement, the nice things that your your teammates, your family are all saying about you as well, it, it speaks volumes. So I guess when other people are saying nice things, you don't need to say nice things yourself. It's had about eighty thousand views, I think. That, that yeah, that cricket one. Yeah, yeah, that was good. That was really nice. Good. Um, there wasn't really a question there. But no, we just we're just, yeah. just singing your praises as well. We're just jumping, jumping on the bandwagon and picking you up. But let's let's build into the World Test Championship. So, about a month before the final, you announced that you were retiring. That would be your last series, your last games. Um, obviously, a lot of thought went into that. How did you arrive at that decision? Yeah, um, I've been thinking about it for a couple of years. You sort of start to plan how much longer you have left. And I've sort of had some niggles in the knees and hips and back and, um, but actually the last two years, my body's felt really, really good. So I so, said, okay, we'll push it again, we'll push it again. But towards the end of the summer, um, the runs had kind of dried up. The last six months, the, right, the runs had dried up and just had a new little boy at home, six months old now, and and I could not get out of this rut of not getting the runs or not performing to the standards or expectations that I have within myself. And things just became a little bit tougher to get going again. And I've, I've had ruts before and, and I've got the drive to get out of them. This time, that drive is not quite the same. And so, yeah, by the end of the ND summer, I'd, I knew that it was pretty much time to, to call it a day and 
start looking elsewhere. Spend some time at home. Yeah, um, the Black Caps manager, Mike Sandal, right, uh, had a story in the Herald a few weeks back, and he mentioned that I think he'd been away from home for 250 days across a calendar year um, last season and sort of the effect that has. How it, it wouldn't be the same for you wouldn't have been quite that much, but how does that affect the, the family life? Like that's got to be tough. Does does Jessica, your wife, do, do they travel with you on occasion, or is it out of sight, out of mind? Um, uh, families come before. Um, I mean, they'll definitely make the Boxing Day test or the Christmas time period, uh, New Year's and things like that. But yeah, a lot of the last couple of years hasn't actually been spent overseas for me. But a lot of it, especially with the ND, it's travelling between the mounts, Whangarei, uh, Auckland, Wellington. I mean, we're all, all over the shop and we sort of come home for a day and out. And that becomes quite taxing, especially with two kids at home. And, and I know Jess is working bloody hard to, to make sure they're, they're in line. Um, and you can sort of feel the pressure from both ends. And and when you're consistently away, it's it's hard to, you know, yeah, I mean, it becomes tough to stay focused, I reckon, because I think a lot of focus for me goes into the cricket. Um, but yeah, it's an extra. It's, that's an extra external pressure, isn't it? Even you got the best wife in the world; she's got that shit sorted. You still feel guilty for not being there or whatever it is, and it, and adds an extra layer, doesn't yeah, it? That yeah, builds you, when you get two two kids. It's yeah, yeah sort of doubles. Yes, yeah. yeah, the second one definitely. Lifted the energy levels in the house. <laughs> um, good fun, good fun, but you, you, it's challenging, isn't it? and and I'm sure most people with kids out there understand the the, the different pressures that their family life brings. So you've been home with the kids for a couple of weeks, a couple of months now. Are you ready to get back out? Back, get back out yeah, there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's been two weeks, and yeah, had to have a couple of beers and sit down with the lads, and just, uh, just catch my breath and get some adult time in. But this is why we do the podcast. This, <laughs> yeah, is, my, yeah. this is my escape. <laughs> so Stevie's escape. Thanks for joining me. Um, so once you've made that decision consciously, is that a liberating feeling, knowing that the end is in sight and and that you're that this is going to be it? It was, yeah, yeah. I I sort of had a bad run there, got another duck or something, and I was like, nah, that's me. I'm done. And it took me a day, and I, yeah, to let the emotions sort of ride with that failure. And I was like, nah, nah, I just, I've had enough of having to turn up every day and, and feeling that pressure all the time, the nerves, etc. Um, and so when I made the call, and that last game finished for ND, and I was like, yeah, Jess, I think we'll call it there. It felt really, really good. Um, obviously, I had to tell a few people just so they could get organised with selections, contracts whatever was coming up and that felt good too just to let the right people know and, and it was nice for it just to yeah and then I knew it was like three months I got three months I'll put on what I can for the next three months just go hard um, and, and that's me and so it was a nice relieving feeling to go yeah this is it and anyone try and turn you around? Nah, fucking hell, BJ. Come on, one more time around the clock. You've, <laughs> you've still got it. You've got this. Uh, there's, you get the few sly comments in there but I knew I knew myself that I was done, and uh, I think a few other people did too. So, nah, it was it was done. <laughs> it wasn't too many. What's what sort of a hammering has your body taken over the years? Yeah, yeah, fairly bashed up. Um, my hips and knees and back are the the ones that just sort of just wear and tear. I reckon, eh? And you crouched over for a long, long time. Yeah. Day after day Squatting. after day. Yeah. yeah. Deep squat. Yeah, you'd be terrible. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how you wicket kicked. <laughs> That's probably a, what a, broke me. Yeah, yeah potentially. Uh, I guess so. <laughs> Riddled with arthritis now because yeah. of those uh, yeah. five years as a wicket keeper. Yeah, I reckon that's, yeah. I think also cricket's very one side dominant. So batting, you're, you're landing on your left leg the whole time. So that's just jarring on the, on the hips. And you, I think your left leg's stronger in the hamstrings and your other leg's stronger in the quads. And so that imbalance, imbalance, yeah, plays a part, and especially my left hip, and probably my left knee, and then my right knee started to get a bit tweaky as well. And it's, like, and it's not actually enjoyable playing when you're just niggled. Mm. Like nothing was major, but it was just niggly. And you get through a day of 90 hours, and you're like, oh, thank goodness that's over. Mm. But last year, I honestly 
couple of Voltarans and a few beers and, and sweet. Like my body felt pretty good. Um, Voltaren and beer is a, yeah, dang, it's, it's a dangerous it's, combo. It's a great it's combo. Dangerous <laughs> combo. <laughs> it keeps you going. Um, okay, so let's build. So, so you make the decision to retire. You've got the fucking World Test Championship coming up. But hang on, is any part of you concerned that you might not get selected once you've made that call for the Black Caps um, for the for the World Test Championship? Nah, no. Nah, I had discussions right. around it with Steady and um, and Kane, and um, yeah, and we we're taking twenty people on that tour. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Even if I'm not the, right, even good if luck. I'm the final eleven, I'll still sort of be somewhere there. Yeah. And right. Hopefully, you know, help out on the sidelines. So. Um, oh, I'm glad they picked me in the end. <laughs> <laughs> is there is there an extra layer of emotion though? Going to the airport for that last time, that last tour, those warm up games, is everything feeling like the last one? Yes, uh, I, I wouldn't say emotional. Um, I'm not terribly emotional, or yeah, I don't think too deeply about that stuff. But I said you know, after the warm up game had finished, I walked past Gary and said, "That's the last one of them, mate. You beauty." <laughs> <laughs> And then when you're sort of counting down into that final and you've got two trainings left and have your last training, you say, thanks Gary, that's my last one of them, done. Yeah. And then you sort of count down your five warm-ups, which are <laughs> cricket's kind of worst nightmares. And then you go past Chris and say, thank you, Chris, that is my last warm-up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I haven't been for a run since the game, so I will start doing that again. That surprises me because <laughs> I'd heard from a lot of people that you really, fitness was one of the things that you yeah. really... Prided yourself. I can't say prided yourself. You, Proed? Proed yourself. <laughs> Proed yourself on. You, you were really fit. Um, so that surprises me. Yeah. It's yeah, okay. I've, I've, I've got a treadmill coming because it'll be all right on my knees and I'll get started once it arrives. I don't know. I don't know. It's, I said to Jess, I probably haven't been this inactive for my whole life, apart from when I'm maybe two. But I'm keen to get back into it now. I've given the body a rest. The finger sort of couldn't really do too much with it for three weeks anyway. But um, yeah, you, when you don't have that, I guess that it's, next thing to go to, to you know, yeah. you're going on a trip here. So now you start your fitness. You want to be up there in the top fitness and make sure you're ready to go. It's that's kind of gone. So I guess it's strange for me to wake up and go. Mm, I don't really need to run today. I, I can just chill out and play with the kids and. But no, I need that drive and, and I'll hopefully get some of that back. And It's funny, I'm going through the exact same thing on like 10 levels down where I was <laughs> playing like first team football at the start of the season, got myself super fit, the fittest in the team. And I haven't been for a run for four months because I picked up a few injuries and a few niggles and it's just, you get into that habit of things start to slip and then you're just like, well, I'm just... That's, need, that's that's fight. That yeah. Yeah. I need to get back out there <laughs> Hopefully can do some coaching, and it's still reasonably physical. So um, I do want to start running in, but I'm in no rush right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we make it to the, the final. Um, good build-up games against England. Everything's going well. And then the rain comes. And it pisses down, and it with, pisses rain. down with rain on day one. Day one of your last ever test, which is a world championship final, arguably the biggest game that you've ever been involved with. What do you do? What do you do on that rain day? Oh, it was actually brilliant. I mean, cricketers love rain sometimes. Um, yeah, what do you do on a, <laughs> on a rained out day? <laughs> well, we knew we had six days, so that first one was like, okay, sweet. Well, nothing really changes here. Um, and the fact that we were on the hotel at the ground, and you could see the ground was basically underwater, and it was just pissing down the whole day, you could, you could just chill out. Sometimes you normally have to drive to the ground on a mm. bus, you're under PMOA, so your phones get handed in and you pretty much get locked down in the changing room, which can be quite a long, boring, tedious day. Um, so it was great. We were at the hotel, looked out, no, we don't need to go anywhere. If they decide we're going to go play, we just jog onto the ground and start warming up. So, so we knew we weren't going anywhere that first day. And so we had a team room up in the hotel and played I table saw the tennis. table tennis. Yeah, and, table yeah. tennis, darts. Um, Are the physios shitting themselves about you? Athletes playing table tennis and rolling an ankle and getting overexerted and or are they just like ah, whatever? I, I think the thing with our team is we're reasonably relaxed and you know your own your your body you know yourself and some things get certain people up some things don't and it's kind of free for all. I mean, 
within common sense. Um, Shay, you might roll your ankle playing table tennis, but world class athletes. Well, I'm a they're, pretty good table tennis player. You've seen probably, you've played against me. Uh, they're probably all right. They're probably all right. Yeah, okay, I get, yeah, I'm, I'm, they're competitive guys. So sometimes competition, you, maybe you're diving for that one that you don't need to dive for. Mm, that's yeah. true. Yeah. Sensible guy. The time. There, yeah. see? Yeah. Okay. I'm a competitive that, guy. I wouldn't do that. I think that is what it is. I yeah. mean, you could be walking down the stairs to bat and roll your ankle. Yeah. There's a lot you of. You may as well have fun. Yeah. Doing it. Like, there's no point in worrying about what might happen sometimes. There's a lot of famous stories of, of athletes twinging a back, picking up a kid. Dropping an aftershave yeah. bottle, cutting their foot. I mm. wonder how many of those are true. Yeah, none. Mm. <laughs> none. They were like Wayne Rooney. Oh, I fell asleep in the bar. <laughs> oh, really? With those three women around you? That's weird. <laughs> okay, so let's fast forward to the final day. Like, what a climax to the Test Series and your career. Talk us through your final day. What, what do you remember? Uh, I remember feeling reasonably relaxed, uh, especially in the morning. Like, going, well, it's my last night. Wake up in the morning, have some breakfast, quite chilled, and, and I'm actually quite in a, I'm a nervous guy when I'm playing cricket, uh, especially when I'm going out to bat or, or keep. Um, and so I was reasonably relaxed, going, this is pretty cool. And, and at the time, the game was kind of like, mm, it's here. We don't really know what's going to happen, so we're just going to go out there and, and play. Um, and that was the feeling around the group, and I thoroughly enjoyed, especially that morning and that lead up and. All of a sudden, we had a couple of wickets, so I was like, okay, okay, we're in a game here, and getting Coley out and Pajara early on that um, that last day, and then it was like, oh, yeah, here we go. We can actually roll through these guys now, and kind of all unfolded perfectly. So with, I don't know, 20 runs to get, Kane and uh, Ross are out there. What's the mood? What's happening in the change room and the pavilion, whatever it is? Is everyone starting to come together and bubbling away? Like, what's that energy like? Yes, yeah. I mean, when we're out there to bat, what's well, 140 runs and 50 odd overs, wasn't it? Something like that. And me, Henry Nichols, and Luke Ronke, the batting coach, we were actually upstairs because of COVID times. We basically had a whole level downstairs to ourselves, and and the change room was upstairs, so we had heaps of room. And I'd parked up upstairs because I'm a, an anxious watch. I was sort of strut around the shed. And um, we obviously went bang, bang, and two for 40. And I'm going, fuck, okay, pads are on and it's on here. And um, But as we got closer in every run, I mean, we cheered just about every single, every run. Um, it was one of those types of games. 20 runs out, we're going, yeah, fuck, we're going to, I mean, we're going to do this. Uh, Kane decides to slog one up and it goes straight up in the end. Oh, shit, here we go. I might have to get out there to finish this off. <laughs> I'm sort of going, I'd love to go out there and finish this off, but I actually, fuck, no, I don't really want to go out there at all. Um, so that gets dropped, and, and we sort of milk away the runs. But it, this wicket was not easy to bat on. So you never felt truly comfortable, um, especially with the quality they have too. But you could see the energy building slowly within the guys and... Um, us three upstairs stayed there the whole time and, and the rest of the bowlers who are, you know, a bit more chatty sort of downstairs, they carried on down there and um, when Ross hit those runs there, yeah, it's just pure joy. You could see, up and down. yeah, you could see the camaraderie on those shots, everyone arm over arm jumping around, like that is what you play sport for, that yeah. is the ultimate yeah. sort of dream come true. And I mean, some of those boys have been through the two World Cups uh, finals, come second both occasion, obviously the last one that they had was, I mean, dramatic as it can possibly be with a draw, a double draw. Um, so, I mean, for those guys, it was, uh, I was truly happy for them that they managed to lift the trophy. And For those guys, it. but for you too, like, like Brendan said, you were part of that Black Caps team when they were really up against it, really struggling, that 45 mm. all out, you know, and then to get to where they are now, like, they're like such, like the perfect way to end a career. Like how yeah. how amazing is that? Couldn't script it. Yeah. Um, but so so what happens after that? So is it down into the changing rooms? Is it is the manager got a bucket of beers? Is it just everyone's having a few? Uh, um, so after the game, yeah, there was a, there was a chili bin there waiting for us. So we obviously shook hands and, and did the did the thing there, grab, have a quick beer, really quick, because then you've got to get out there for the 
presentations and stuff and and sort of go see the fans and, and thank them and do a few interviews so generally that takes about half an hour and but it, i mean it's awesome to soak it up but we had a little contingent of kiwi fans just next to us and they had their shirts off and it was it was awesome it was amazing um but yeah i was definitely looking forward to getting the formalities over with and ripping it. into the shed yeah yeah into the shed to to drink a bit of piss that's always been the best part of being a sportsman those big wins and that cha those changing room beers mm. after a win where it's just that group that's done it and there's no outsiders and it's just the lads in there that's a special moment were you was it more meaningful in that instance again was it were you were you aware of the weight of it yeah yeah i think especially because i knew it was the last time i'd probably do it like that uh, having a test win last test win and i've always enjoyed win or lose just sitting back appreciating the five days tour that we've been through and having a few beers beers with the lads and, and often in some someone's done well that game so celebrating the 100 or the fifer and um that's that'll be truly one thing that i i will miss and but that was that was pretty epic to to have a trophy in front of us and and drink this at the same time it was yeah, it was, I, yeah, I'll definitely, well, I'll remember most of it. <laughs> <laughs> Not too far to go to the hotel either, so yeah. No, nah, no, no, no driving, nothing, no admin, just in the white straight across the field, back to the team room up there and a few beers in there and then, yeah. What's the turnaround between that game and then getting on a plane and coming home? Uh, we had 24 hours. Oh, that's a long flight too. Yeah, yeah, but it was... I mean, we had the trophy with us, so... You was, had the trophy the whole way, right? Is that right? Oh, uh, no, I didn't take it on the plane. I ended up getting getting it for quarantine. Right. Yeah, no, too much admin for me the next morning. I was trying to get the boys up in the morning at about 9 a.m. to start again. <laughs> 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 I didn't get too many takers. There was a few dusty lads. <laughs> um, that is, I just can't get my head around that. It's such a great story. It's such a but it's such a it's such a weird one as well because then you do you come home and then you got 14 days by yourself in a hotel mm. that's a weird one as well <laughs> yeah 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 i mean did that take some of the excitement out of it or are you still just buzzing that you're, you're just replaying it and you zooming the other guys in other rooms and <laughs> yeah. having an online drinking session <laughs> to carry on or what is it it's so weird yeah it did feel strange i mean it would have been uh, it's hard to know what we, what we would have done if we were allowed out um I'd, I'd imagine we would have gone somewhere definitely for that week and yeah. another drink and two. Um, but yeah, it, it wasn't the most enjoyable way to do it. Um, but hopefully, you, you know, maybe in two or three or four months, um, we'll all catch up again and, and have another session and just reflect. But yeah, it was a shame. But that's the times we're in, isn't it? It is. And you had a uh, dispensation for surgery when you came home. Is that right? Is yeah. Like you? Yeah, well... I actually, I thought the finger was literally just dislocated and I thought it might be all right. Um, but we needed to get it x-rayed and we didn't have much time in England. So it was pretty much, we had to go through the, the process of trying to get to the, the hospital back home. And that was a bit of a, a mission. So about six days later, um, they gave us an exemption to, to go to the hospital, get an x-ray. But it was done all hardcore. Um, had security guards with me. Um, everyone had their masks, PPE gear and got shipped into an isolation room there and they checked it all out and so yeah yeah um so what did you actually do it is it was still dislocated at the time and it was fractured in four place well four bits around the the knuckle joint and at what point of the test did that happen uh last day i think we had about maybe that lunch lunch session I can't quite remember. It was a shocking throw from Kane. Yeah. <laughs> I had to try to deal with it and try to get it somewhere near the stumps and ended up throwing my hand at the ball, which was a bit silly. And yeah. yeah. And is adrenaline taking it? Like, you're, you're, like you said, you're padded up, ready to go. Are you feeling that at the time or is adrenaline taking over? Or No, I was feeling it straight away. I was, And then I took my glove off and saw it sort of sticking that way a little bit. And I was like, nah, I don't. And I don't do shit like that well at all. I was like, Ugh. <laughs> yeah, so he got the physio to try and yank it back in there and that actually felt better when he got it into a bit of position but then I couldn't close my glove properly so the, the doc just got a local zapped it in there and I couldn't feel that finger for the well for the next two hours at least and then it started to come back and you 
jab it again and you can't feel it. And, and you, but you're like, no way, I'm not replaced. No one's, I'm, I'm staying on. I was definitely, yeah, yeah. Um, unless I was going to, I know I was going to make an error, which we had a perfectly, and Tom Blunt or perfectly a good, good, good keeper to um, manage it. Um, I certainly wasn't going to, yeah, I wanted to get back out there. Yeah. And, and I could close the glove again and I felt fine. So, yeah. But if I was, if I was going to cause the team any harm by doing that, then I would have stayed off. So there's this incredibly good video on YouTube um, made by a guy called Jared Kimber. Um, about your career. I don't know if you've seen it. It's um, It's got like animations. It's it's a stat driven video, but it's sort of, he's brought it to life with animation. And there's some really good stuff in it. And I'm just gonna read some of it to give the listeners uh, a bit of an overview of, of what your career was like. And the premise is that you had a really peculiar career arc, which essentially boiled down to facing as many t test deliveries as possible while being invisible. And he says, um, you know, BJ's stats across his test career, he faced more balls than test openers do on average, which was 80. He scored the second longest innings ever by a keeper, and the eighth, and the 11th. In 2019, he was the second best player in the world in terms of balls faced per innings. But the, the sort of anomaly of his career is that he only wicket kept in five of his first 40 first class matches. He opened the batting for New Zealand for the first five games, didn't keep wickets till his ninth test. And he says it's like New Zealand hypnotised him to believe he was still an opener and wasn't wicket keeping. And then you replaced McCullum as the wicket keeper, who was the total opposite to you. And when you both wore the gloves, you scored more runs. Uh, you're the fifth best average of any test wicket keeper of all time. Uh, and he says that a few months before McCullum actually said that you were his favourite player, you averaged 33 over your first 20 tests, but McCullum saw something different, and over your next 50 tests, you averaged 40, which is an all-time high for a New Zealand keeper. So the question at the end of this, I want to talk a little bit about your relationship with Brendan McCullum, um, but he says that you're his favourite player when your stats and your record at the time really don't suggest that should be the case um what did he see like what was that relationship like with McCullum and what do you think he saw that perhaps other people didn't at the time that's a good question um uh, maybe yeah I mean I think he said that after one of the games against West Indies over there um and we played in Trinidad and we were actually getting spanked and the second innings, I managed to bat, I think I only got about 60 odd, but it was about 210 balls. Um, and Mark Craig, we had a big partnership. It just, we lasted about 210 balls between us and kind of just drew that game out on day four and made it go to day five, which West Indians would have fucking hated. Um, and I guess he, at the time, maybe saw a little bit of that, that fight. Um, which I know he wanted New Zealand cricket to, to have, um, especially when he was trying to get everything going again. Um, and so maybe that is why. I mean, I enjoyed having a beer with Baz a lot too. And yeah, I love talking about the game with him. Um, and and we, yeah, I, I think the way he brought up players and his relationships with players, he put a lot of effort into it to make you feel comfortable firstly and confident and, and try and get that to try and get the best out of each player and, and Baz was excellent at that um, and I, I thoroughly enjoyed the way he went about it. I was listening to um, again Sweeney's podcast with McCullum and he said that McCullum said that it was so engrossing for him as a captain because he was so invested in all the players to the point that he was invested in their off the field lives and he'd go and and have dinner with families and things and sort of get inside their household. Did he do that with you? Like when you were a young player, did, did he come around and, and meet the family? Like was it that relationship? Um, I mean, he did, yeah. I mean, it was just me and Jess at the time. So uh, we'd often, Jess would come on tour and we'd be down at the bar and, and have a beer there. I know him and Roman would, most days would go downstairs in the lobby somewhere just, basically to 
see guys come in and say good day, potentially start up a chat if you wanted. If you didn't, you went back to your hotel room and, and he just, I mean, the effort they put into to make guys feel welcome uh, was, yeah, exceptional to be fair and, and really started to get the team to sort of gel and work out how different people click too. Some guys won't be that chatty and figuring out the best way to, to deal with them is one way and other guys will love it. And and the way they did that was, yeah, exceptional. And, and yeah, I mean, Baz tried to get to know everyone on, on the same wavelength. I've got to ask, in that um, record 352-run partnership you had with McCullum against India in 2014, you got 124. A shit, you're, you're, you're out there with him for a long time. What do you talk about in between overs? <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, yeah, I mean, Baz, Baz goes through moments, eh, like in his innings, and this was a particular innings where it was literally about batting as long as we could. Um, runs were important as well because they, they take overs out of the game, etc. cetera. Um, but we had a couple of conversations just about reining it in, um, and he was actually very disciplined in that innings. I think he still struck it 50, you know, 300 off. 600 balls, something like that anyway, which is quite conservative for Baz. But he was really smart in the way he went about it. But every now and then you could just see him wanting to just let loose and, and just bomb a six. And he got to 195, I think, and he just went, boop, smacked the six, got to 200. And uh, we had a couple of conversations, just, yeah, keep going, mate, keep going, keep picking your balls. Um, but we'd often talk about getting to tea and, and having a pole and, <laughs> and having a coffee, and, and then we'll start again, eh? We'll start again. So we we'll sort of drive ourselves just, in, yeah, okay, okay, it's nearly there, 10 minutes, mate, and we can get one. So <laughs> I'm glad you brought out, up the, the durries because um, <laughs> in my notes, I've got to ask you, you said the only time uh, our informer has seen you irate was when an ND coach tried to stop you from smoking. Yeah, that, yep, that time, yeah, he wound me up. <laughs> I'd actually given up, but... Um, had about three ducks in a row, and I was like, Bruce, can I have uh, Bucko, Bruce Martin? Could I steal one of your poles, mate? I'm just a bit anxious here. <laughs> Got in trouble for that that day, and I didn't really enjoy it. No. <laughs> Are you one of the last cricket's last great smokers? Are there that, Look, there, I haven't had a pole around? for a long time now. I've been off them for, for about four years, five years. There can't um, be that many around, surely. There's not many. Nah, nah, there's not a lot at all. Um, the old person might have one on the piss. Oh, yeah, uh, that's, that's, that's fine. Yeah, that's Chris fine. Martin, we used to sort of have a couple in our time, but there's not many these days at all. And, and this is a good thing. It, yeah. I mean, it's a terrible habit, I, and I definitely regret starting smoking. Yeah, but as the um, like as sports developed, is the uh, what do you call it? The dietitian, all those, although the S and C guy, are they all hammering you about it. Are you sneaking around, or is it just kind of an open secret that? Yeah, these three are off they go again behind the bike sheds and <laughs> yeah, come back smelling like links. It's a, <laughs> yeah, it's a funny thing with smoking because I think the more you push someone to to give up, the more they fight back at it as well. Um, and, and Chris Donaldson, our fitness trainer, he would just mention it every now and then and he'd do it subtly, but he never pushed it um, because, I mean, it was one of the things I, I, I smoked, but I made sure that, it never affected me in terms of my fitness and my running, and I made sure I was up there um, with my fitness because I smoked probably, mm. um, and it gave them nothing to to come at me with. It was like, you know, I'm still running this time in the yo-yo, mate, and and so it, cricket's an interesting game, but I, it certainly helped ease my nerves, and and for me it worked while I was playing cricket and batting and. Um, yeah, well, we I had Ryan, wouldn't recommend it though. Yeah, well, we had Ryan Nelson on a couple of episodes ago, and, and he was talking about uh, one of his teammates who was smoking at half time in an English Premier League game. So it's not like it's that out there that athletes like to like to smoke, just like everybody else. You're all just normal people. It's just you're in the spotlight, so people think, oh, they need to act differently to, to kind of the rest of us. Yeah, yeah. I'm really glad that you guys didn't talk shop every over in that 
<laughs> Mammoth 352 run partnership because the image I had in my head is of you and Baz just just talking shit just you know yeah. you focus for the balls and then you're just kind of like I don't know talking about punting or were you going for a pint afterwards or Spot, what's, spotting someone what's in the good crowd Netflix. <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's my vision anyway I think well there's probably 160 odd overs of it and you kind of you also end up just going punch gloves and Walking back. Yeah. yeah. I've, I've spent a bit of time with you now, but I've, I've got, got nothing, nothing else. I've got nothing. Yeah, in those, like all jokes aside, in those long, long partnerships, are you getting back to the hotel afterwards and be like, I don't want to see you until we go back to the ground tomorrow? Because you do, you spend so much time with, with those people in the middle, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to think of what those nights. To be fair, those nights are generally, you finish the game, you, you have a little recovery session, and boom, you go to bed. Pretty much, you you've cooked after a day like that. You get a little massage in there as well, or? Uh, can, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Especially in my older age, I would definitely get jump on the table rubs. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you need your space. You try doing fifty-two long-form podcasts with a bloke. You <laughs> just you need a bit of a break. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Glad I haven't seen you for three weeks. <laughs> okay, we've we've pumped your tires a little bit, so I'm gonna I am gonna ask you about um, that game, January second, twenty thirteen. First test against South Africa. South Africa won by an innings in 24 runs, and New Zealand was skittled for 45 in the first innings. Quite early in your Black Caps career. Um, batting at number six, you got a golden duck. What was that? We, we've talked about the, the best times in the changing room. What's the changing room look like after that? Mm, yeah, yeah, it was definitely a, a dark game. Um, I think it might have been my second or third game keeping. So I had a lot of focus on making sure I was tidy with the gloves. Um, I was reasonably nervous going into the game, just purely on that that basis. But um, we got told that if we win the toss and Table Mountain has it's a clear sky, then bat. So that was the comms that we'd been given for that game. And that was clear. And we won the toss and we were like, right, fuck it. We're getting out of here and we're going to have a bat. And that wicket was just doing, it wasn't horrendous wicket, but it was just doing enough. And it was one of those days where it was like snick, snick, snick. And you'd, the playing misses were, were not happening for us. But we had a decent partnership, eh? Well, eight overs it lasted. I don't think we lost the wicket. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then it started and I was batting six, so... First one's out, and I sort of strap my pads on, start to get ready, and then bang, bang, bang. The twelfth over, I'm fucking, I'm out there, and then I'm walking straight back in, and <laughs> it just happened so quickly. I don't know what it lasted, but eighteen overs, and I was like, wow, wow. And well, I mean, we knew so we were good, like Dale Stain, more and more cool. Um, for Lander, I think he took five for that. Like the, like, for us as a young team, then was, I mean, that's a tough bowling attack, and they executed. And then they proceeded to just like Hashim Amla. Uh, I'm not sure if AB got runs, probably did, but and then they just scored 300 for two, and we didn't look like taking wickets. So it was like this is, and it was a learning curve. It was a massive learning curve. We actually managed to guts it out in the second innings, and it was all over in three days. But we we got to about 260, and, and Dino Dean Brownley scored a, a fantastic hundred, and we scrapped away for that second inning. So we, I think we looked at it at the end of the day, at the end of the game, that. We had some fight in us, um, but it was a pretty dark sort of shared year. We, we got dealt it. We got we got taught a lesson. But for us, it was moving forward. We we had to figure out a way to either prepare for the next one. Um, how we're going to deal with it? I, I actually don't think we dealt with the second one any better, to be honest. But does it, can the coach say anything after that? Like, do you all come in? You, you've been scheduled for forty five. All right, guys, bring it in. Bring it in. What the f what the fuck was that? <laughs> <laughs> what can you say in that point? Or is it just kind of like, look, we move on? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I can't remember exactly what was said, but I knew that there was definitely some planning going on from there, and it's just starting to nut out exactly how this team is going to move forward. And it wasn't going to happen the next game or maybe the next series. I think they realised that at the time, but I think the key leadership. Um, Mike Hesson, Baz. That was the catalyst, right? Yeah, for, uh, for like... and, and I'm pretty, I've heard that they got down, sat it out, and 
came up with a plan and we're going to move in this direction. So that was the learning from that that trip. Um, yeah. And we s- slowly managed to make some gains. And test cricket's hard because, yeah, I mean, the best teams in the world play for five days and they play for five series and they keep coming in every day. And we had to start learning how to how to do that in our own way. Again, I keep knuckling this point, but I just want to get it across to the, to the listeners. Like, your career arc has been perfect. Like, you started during that, like, mm. the, de- the definitive, like, rock-bottom performance where everything was decided we need to change direction. McCullum comes in, gets you to a point. Williamson takes over, takes you to the world champions. And, and then, then you, you ride off into the sunset. <laughs> the sunset like. <laughs> See you later, boys. Come on, how good. That is, that is incredible, eh? That yeah. is actually incredible. And yeah. it's all this, it's this perfect storm of the, the youth teams that were coming through, the generation of cricketers that were coming through. Like Stephen said, the batons pass from one to the other to the other. And it has. It's just culminated in this amazing experience that all of us fans and i think that's it's why that mace tour is so important because cricket fans in new zealand are kind of long suffering you've mentioned already the two um the two world cups um where we lost the final i remember the 92 world cup um the semi-final loss when inzaman Mohuk broke our hearts I, I still hold on to that now um so it is it's kind of ingrained in our in our culture which is interesting in terms of your background as coming to new zealand at age 10? Yep, yep. So were your heroes growing up South African heroes? Well, they must have been. I'm assuming they were. They were, yeah. yeah. I mean, I like Jaunty Rhodes. Um, his energy in the field and, and his sort of innovative batting, small bloke. Um, sort of looked up to him when I was younger. Not a lot of people realise he was an Olympic hockey player as well. Yeah, and good at hockey. Good. Not a lot of people realise that. Keep you around. Keep yeah. Coming up with that And it is Olympic time, so yeah. appropriate. Um, Came to Tokoroa? Yep. yep. Dur- Durban to Tokoroa? Yep. How does that, how does that happen? Well, mum came over a month before we, um, we moved and she got a job and that was the job she got offered was to teach at Balmoral School in Tokoroa. Um, and you see, South Africa at the time, uh, it, was, it was starting to go downhill. Um, the violence was picking up and bits and pieces and she I think she did enough and was ready for a bit of a change so she made the bowl call um, and picked up the job and uh, we didn't know any better well she obviously didn't know any better but um, yeah Tokara but to be honest it was freedom for us I, I wasn't allowed to go I couldn't just bike to the dairy in South Africa it was we're in this sort of university lockdown fences up security guards it was completely different to what we came over to Tokara. Oh, I was loving it. Jump on the bike, go to the dairy, grab some lollies, you know, just bike to school and it was just safe as and we were like, this is this is awesome. And I actually loved my three years in Tokara. Um made some good friends. Um probably don't keep in touch enough now, but yeah, my first three years in Tokara was an experience and well, it introduced us to New Zealand, which was awesome. Now is one of the first things you're doing trying to find a cricket club to play at? Yes, yeah, yeah. Mum was running around. I think we went to Taupo a bit. Um, yeah, play for try to play for Midlands. I was going to say, is, mid, is it Midlands? Yeah, it was Midlands yeah. then. Now yeah. it's Waikato Valley now. Uh, but eventually, she she talked to Zane Bentley up here and started playing a bit of um, yeah club cricket. My, my notes suggest that um, in South Africa you're playing hardball cricket and you got a bit yeah. frustrated that it was sort of Kiwi cricket when you got here to New Zealand. Is it yellow yeah. stumps? Are we talking yellow stumps, yeah. yellow ball? Yeah, yellow plastic. Yeah. yeah, underarm. Plastic, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. My, uh, just a moan strip on an outfield and back home, well, sorry, in South Africa. That's okay. Um, <laughs> like we literally had rolled grass wickets and hard balls. It was like you're straight in there, like seven years old, guys running hardball pets. I don't know if we had helmets back then, but pads, gloves, it was like proper cricket. So the shock for the first two years of coming to that, now, I, I, I was really pissed off with mum actually. I was like, this is shit. Because at, at, at age nine, eight, seven, eight, nine, have you already got ambitions of being an international cricketer? I think that's where your dreams start. Um, I sort of would sit in the garage tapping the old sock and ball and pretend I was John D. Rose trying to win the World Cup. I mean, that's where they start, isn't it? Um, but you, you don't really know much when you're seven, eight, nine. 
Yeah. But I knew I love cricket, I love rugby, I love hockey, I love tennis, I love sports, and the downgrade there really frustrated me. But yeah, you but move you on, eh? You yeah. move on and started to make a few teams when I was probably too young, but at 13, you started playing here with hardball and, and proper stuff, and it was about maybe 12. Yeah. But boys high hostel, right? No. You were in hostel boy? No. Oh. So you moved to Hamilton, though? Yeah, so moved to Hamilton when I was yeah. year nine mm. um, and stayed with my auntie who'd moved over from South Africa. And mum stayed in Tokara, I worked there, and yeah, yeah, yeah. spent the time with her throughout my high school years. And was Boys High by accident or by design? Was it, this is the best cricket school in the region, so I'm going to go here, or was it just a... No, I think mum realised... There's more opportunities in Hamilton in general. Yeah, uh, I don't think she was even thinking cricket, or I wasn't even thinking cricket. I'd love to play rugby. I thought it was mean at rugby. Um, Were you? I was okay. I could only kick the ball twenty meters, but I was okay. I loved tackling. Yeah, love just. Yeah, what position were you as a wooden shield? I was ten. I was ten. I, I reckon I was more. I should have been more of a a little flanker. You know, one of those guys just runs yep. around, grabs legs, tries to get up, grab the ball. That that should have been my role, but. Um, yeah, and hockey, like I just love sport and I think mum saw Hamilton boys as just a good opportunity to, and I absolutely hated her for sending me there because I just started to make some friends, get right. comfortable in Tokara and settle in after a big shift and I was fucked off with her <laughs> the first year and then slowly, it's a hard transition. And, yeah, started to make a few friends and just adapting to that. So. How, how does your mum... Coming across the world when you're young, just you and her, you go on to this insanely great career, successful career. Is she is she on? Is she watching every game? Is she messaging you afterwards? Is she in, emotionally invested in every innings you play? Yeah, I'm not 100 percent sure, but I, I I know she definitely watches a lot. Um, but she she learned quite quickly not to talk too much about it with me. I think. When I was younger, we'd just argue. Uh, we'd try to talk, but she'd tell me maybe, oh, why'd you get out for 20? You know? And I'm like, oh, I, got it. I played a bad shot. And maybe at the time, it's good to reflect myself. And um, But I used to hate her chipping in with her comments. So I think she learned quite quickly just the times to leave it, the times to maybe talk about it. And she figured it all out as well. Um, and that's it's just relationships, isn't it? But, yeah, yes. when she started to chip in too much, it wound me up a bit, eh? <laughs> that's think, boys. Yeah. In well, general, that's just parents. get out. Yeah. Get out. Yeah. Of it. <laughs> you know. Sorry for the ignorance, but have you got any siblings <clears throat> then, as well? No, nah, just me. Right. Just me. Just me and mum. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So that's such a, such a massive journey to make at such a young age. And yeah, you mentioned she came over earlier, right? So did you then at 10 years no, old? No, she came back. Oh, right. Yeah, grabbed yeah, everything. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. And we, she just came over to explore the opportunities, see if there's jobs available and then she came back and we... And is she still down in... No, she's, she's moved down. She's moved to Hamilton. Yeah, okay. yeah thankfully, because, yeah, the two boys go there a little bit. That's a break. Um, I want to ask you about the short-form game. You played 24 ODIs, which, I don't know, might come as a surprise to some people, but do, do you... Did you think that you got a fair crack in short-term cricket or do you think there's any way you could have played more games than that? Um, yeah, 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 white ball. Yeah, it's been a while. Um, look, for a few years there, I was, I thought I was definitely pushing to, to get a few more cracks. Um, but I can look back at it, and, and to be fair, I've watched these boys go about it now for the last six or seven years, and, and they've set the standard, and I never reached that, that standard. Um, I couldn't generate the strike rate that I needed to, especially at the international level. Um, and but the desire was always there to try and get back um and i managed to get back in 2017 16 not sure but had a little four or five game stint there and just couldn't get going and i needed to get going earlier to build up that confidence for myself and in selectors um i have no dark memories i, I enjoyed striving to make it because it, it helped me in the test as well, I think. Once you've accepted that you're not going to be or you're not striving to be in that team anymore, is it quite a cool experience watching 
like ODIs watching the World Cup, watching these players you know so well and so intimately on the world stage, like do you, how do you watch? Do you watch by yourself? Do you go to the games? Do you what? Do you watch? Yeah, no, I don't go to the games, um, and probably watch maybe twenty percent of them. Yeah, really. I mean, often often they're on during an ND game, or a, and so you'll keep an eye on it. But they're actually quite hard for us to watch when we're busy playing. Um, so I, I'll be interested to see what I do now mm. in retirement. I, I definitely watch the World Cup. Um, well, sort of some early morning stints of the World Cup, not every ball, but. Um, to be honest, I was hoping to make that World Cup in 2019. Uh, that's, I was still playing reasonably good white ball cricket then for um, for ND, and, and I was pushing to get to that World Cup, um, and I was disappointed to miss out. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I thoroughly enjoyed watching them get as far as they did. Um, I love watching Kane Bat, so I try and tune in every time he's out there. And, um, yeah, I mean, I'm gutted I didn't play more games. I would have loved to have been involved more. One of the interesting things I find about cricket, and I might be completely wrong on this, but you've got selectors, right? And they do they select the team on behalf of the coach and captain? And they're just like, okay, this is my team. The selectors have picked it. I've got to deal with it. Or how much influence does coach and captain have on the team been, selection? I think it's been different in terms of different coaches, but I'm pretty sure Hess and Steady are a selector as well as... Um, one or two others, yeah, and Kane or someone might chime in with, yeah, um, their thoughts as well. But um, yeah, the coach has got a, a say in because it's it's just an interesting. Like we come from the football background where coach picks the team and the team goes out, whereas cricket's such a different beast where the captain also has a lot of kind of sway in terms of how things work and the team's almost molded in a captain's image versus football, which is kind of in a coach's image. And I just find that an interesting one when you're talking about selections you've got a coach that coaches across three forms of the game but doesn't necessarily select the team that he played or he that play for him it, it's uh how do those conversations go like are you going fucking hell steady like at a at a in a test match why am i not in the odi team or are you just kind of leaving that all together and just getting on with it i've only just got on with it i, I think i back myself to yeah I, it didn't bother me like i knew boom i'm dropped Okay, I'll figure out, tell me what I need to do and what needs improving. And then that's was the next focus was, okay, I'm going to work on that. Maintain these strengths, but let's get better at this. And I sort of, my attitude, I'd be gutted for a few days. But then it was like, shit, I've got to put myself up and go again. Um, cricket's a different one with captaining. No, like uh, the captain plays an absolute massive role in cricket compared to mm. other sports. I would... I would think I would sort of like rugby. Yep, you know, a couple of calls, maybe your leadership's more of a a role. Whereas captaining, you are you're deciding whether Tim's bowling now, Trent's bowling, then Wags is bowling, then, and where these guys are going to go. So your whole the whole time you're captaining. So your captain needs the eleven players that I think he wants and wh how he's going to use them best to win a game of cricket. So it's yeah, I mean, I've always found captaining in cricket. A little bit more technical than. Did you do? Did you sports. do much of it? I didn't do a huge amount. No, I, I did bits and pieces, and thoroughly enjoyed thinking about the game and almost switching off sometimes from um, the batting and the keeping. You, you got to think about other stuff, and you ended up sort of relaxing and catching it well or hitting it well. But um, yeah, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I, I like talking to the bowlers about how they're going about their thing, and is there something we can do? Can we shift this guy here? Or, and we've got a big group. We've got eight or nine players that can, I reckon, could all be good captains, to be honest. Mm. You've got a pretty good one. Well, you had a good one in Kane. Um, you know him probably as well as anyone in the cricketing world. Um, off the field, on the field, you've seen him rise to the very top. What is it What is it specifically about his game which makes him the best? Is it hand-eye coordination, technique, temperament, mentality? Or is it just a combination, bubbling of all of those? Is it how hard he trained as a, as a youngster to get his technique right? Like, what, what is it? I think it's, yeah, I mean, it's a bit of everything. Eh? Like, I think his mental strength's strong. He's obviously technically very, very good. Um, the way he thinks about the game as well, I think he's extremely smart and he, he's able to work out opponents and 
potentially what they're trying to do to him and how he's going to navigate through that. Uh, and those are, you see some of the battles when he's under pressure and the way he fights to get through that. Uh, he was struggling big time leading into that that final. Um, just he, he just wasn't feeling it. And some of the nets we had were tough and they were nipping around a bit and he just wasn't feeling um, as good as he would like to. I know that for sure. And, I mean, to I'm not sure what he scored in the first innings. I think it was a good 40-odd. Mm, yeah. Scrappy little 40 yeah, in the yeah. first innings. And then obviously 50 not out in the second. And he'll probably tell you he went into that game feeling horrendous. But somehow kept finding a way to, to get through what he was going to be faced with. And, and that's what he does throughout. And he works out the game extremely quickly and, and how he's going to go about it. And I think that's what makes him so... So good. Mm. Is he now that you've you've left the Black Caps? Is this sort of good guy you'll keep in touch with? You'll that's a that's a relationship for life sort of thing. Yep, yep. I mean, yeah, I definitely hope so. Um, it's just down the road at the mountain. Um, yeah, I'll definitely catch up with Kane for a few beers when he's not too busy and maybe traveling the world. I think he only comes back in Christmas or after the Indian Test series later this year. So, but yeah, no. We'll stay in touch, that's for sure. He's hard to get a hold of. He's unorganised, barely texts back. But I had to laugh. Once he sits down and gets home, you give him a call go, yeah, oh, yeah, come around here. Yeah. So we'll, we'll do that. So I won't be texting him too much. Okay. There's a chance he might listen to this because he's such good friends with you. Kane, <laughs> if you're listening, we're coming for you. It, made, it did make me laugh on that uh, Sins Radio, very first broadcast, their sort of marquee guest. And he wasn't picking up his phone. They've obviously pre-planned it. Like, hey, <laughs> yeah, yeah. we're going to call you at 8 a.m. Okay, like there's going to be a shitload of people listening. Like, give us 10 minutes. So, yeah. And they had uh, Louis Herman Watt on the phone. So, yeah, Kane's not picking up his phone. Uh, we'll keep trying him. And they got him at about 8.20, I think it was. It's like us. So it was 20 minutes late. I think it, I think oh, it was about yeah, yeah. It doesn't surprise me. <laughs> he might have been busy with the baby. A <laughs> <laughs> um, couple of quick fire ones. You're taking strike. Who's the scariest person at the top of their mark about to come down and fling one at you? The, uh, Dale Stein. Yeah. Easily. I wouldn't say easily. Um, Mitchell Johnson was, he was pretty niggly. Uh, Mitchell Stark. But there was something about Stein and his right arm angle to me. He got reasonably tight to the stumps and it just always felt like it was just at you. And he, and he was obviously very smart with the way he swing the ball a little bit and nip it around and and in South Africa the wickets started to deteriorate and these big cracks and fuck sometimes they just launch off a crack and that's somewhere around your head other times they stay low and sort of hit you in the knee roll and you're going holy hell like how am I actually going to hit the ball um I yeah and he could bowl fast but then he could just rein it in suddenly and just start shaping it like Jimmy Anderson, or he'd just go ramp it up 145, and you're like, oh, okay. Like, he was a very smart, clever bowler, and, and he was not enjoyable to face. And then spin-wise, who's the one that you're going, oh, I, I can't really pick this, where this one's going to go? Um, yeah, yeah. Sometimes Ish Sodi, just, I mean, I played with him the most of my, but in the nets and stuff, I'd struggle to pick... Um, his variations. I think Ashman, he's, he's a nice bowler um, and so just subtly changes the speed and it depends where you are. I mean, in, in New Zealand, they're, they're reasonably manageable. When you get over there in India and all of a sudden it's spitting at you and turning a mile, you're like, oh, well, what do I do now? Um, and it's, it's sort of dependent where you, where you ended up. But yeah, I'm trying to think of who else would have played. Yeah, I'd... Ashwin's pretty smart. I'm going to try something here, Shay. We've been talking to BJ for 80-odd minutes now. He's got a bit of a, a gauge on his uh, personality. Yeah. How much of the Olympics do you think he's watching? No. Home with two kids? No. You don't think he's watching None. a single, Not a single lick? He's on the tractor mowing the lawn. <laughs> <laughs> What's the answer? Um, a little bit. Okay. I'm, f I'm definitely following it. So I actually like it to be on with Hudson, four-year-old boy there, just... Keeping an eye on some of the New Zealanders competing. I saw the triathlon come third. Um, that was a watched great race. Watched a bit of the sevens, yeah, to be honest. Yeah, nice. yeah. Mm. yeah they and the mountain biking tonight? actually watched that. That was an unbelievable race too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, bits and pieces, okay. short stints. What about you, Steve? Father of three. Bits you have to do it. Yeah, yeah, I'm working. I'm I'm like yeah, logging the thing. It's uh, it's all go. Holloway House. 
Um, okay, just a, just a couple more for me. Uh, worst teammate to room with across your years uh, with the Black Caps? I don't, I don't think you room with any, yeah. do you? No, we've got a room on our own. If you had to, if you had to room, save. if you had to room, if you had to bunk, if you had to bunk bed with a, with a bloke, MIQ, across, across yeah, your we actually talked about yeah. what happens if we came back and we had two weeks locked in the room um, with one of our teammates. Um, like I love the guy, but it, it would probably be Neil Wagner. His, his energy, he's he's very talkative. And <laughs> yeah, yeah there's, in, there's intensity there, and, and I like my own space, and I feel like he would just encroach on that. Yeah. A bit too much for me, especially two weeks in lockdown or something like that. So, I can see that. but I, yeah. I've roomed with Waggy before at ND, and, and he's he is great. He looks after you. He's yeah. a lovely bloke. But yeah. yeah, yeah. For two weeks in quarantine, no thanks. Mm-hmm. I think I already know the answer to this. But were you a sledger? Not at all. Nah. Did you, every now and then, I might chip in with some something. Cheeky, is it is it all right? Banter yours or is it? Nah, no, nah, I reckon it's terrible. <laughs> I reckon it's terrible. <laughs> Who, who's got the best then on field? But there's a difference between banter and sledging, I reckon. Yeah, banter's... Well, Tim Southey's great. He's he's very quick and witty, and, and it's amazing how quick it suddenly pops into his head, and you're like, yeah, that's good, well done. You got me there, or you, you got him there. Tim, if you're listening, we're coming, <laughs> we're coming for you too. <laughs> uh, international players, sledges, anything that stands out? Uh, my second test against Aussie, um, Ricky Ponting, I was opening the batting then, and Ricky Ponting basically, see, when you're opening the batting, you walk out with your partner, he come up next to us and joined me, and basically walked out with me and told me that this would be my last ever test match, and how useless I am, and wow. um, I was like, okay, hey Ricky, nice to meet you, mate, this is, this is pretty cool, he's talking to me. Yeah. How do you think, old, how do you think you, about that stage? Do you think that was his move? Was, yeah. did, did he do that with everyone, do you think? Do you think he I it? think he might have done it on a few occasions, yeah. but I mean, it was pretty daunting, like the Aussies are obviously a very tough cricket team, and Ricky Ponting was one of my idols growing up, and but at the same time, I thought it was, oh, yeah, this is cool. Maybe I'm getting to it. Maybe, maybe things are good and it needs to get in my head. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, chipping away at an umpire, is that something that you kind of, you do as well in cricket to try and, I guess it's harder now with all of the replays that are available, but is that something that you kind of can do with an umpire? Um, I think if, if you're a spinner, maybe a fast bowler every now and then, you just make sure he's watching, maybe you change a crease angle and see how much it's swinging, you, that type of thing. Um, first class cricket, when there's no replays, yep, you might want to yeah. try to get into the head more. I personally, I'm down the other end, I nearly yeah. talk to the umpires, so um, unless I'm fielding a square leg, yeah. But the spinners are cheeky, they like to, okay, is it hitting? Is it going over? You know, little things like that. When you started your career, IPL wasn't around, yeah. T20 wasn't, wasn't a thing was only in the beginning Just stages, starting, yeah. but there wasn't a lot of money in it. Now, it's obviously this huge cash cow. Obviously, your game isn't set up for T20, and you were never gonna get those huge big paydays. Is there any sort of, I don't know if resentment's the right word. I actually but, had that down on my list without you, putting it on your list. But you <laughs> see the huge, insane paydays some of these guys get for a couple of months of work, and you think, why can't there be like a big paying series for guys that just never get out? <laughs> <laughs> we can keep a coach short in the IPL. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know if the coaches get paid at this. No, Jimmy Pammer gets paid a lot. Yeah. Maybe one day. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I'd be lying if I didn't say there's a bit of jealousy maybe about the big paydays. I think yeah, it would be lovely, wouldn't it? But it's never really... It's never really hurt me. I, I've, my goal is always to play for New Zealand. Um, I'm pretty comfortable in my indie environment, my New Zealand environment, and and I, I just I've loved playing for those those two teams in particular. Because, um, like I said, I enjoy the beers at the end of the game and winning game. And, and as a team, you're building up to try and win this Plunkett Shield or this test series and I love that sort of stuff. I know when you go to IPL, you're, you're building up to try and win that IPL, but it's, for me, it seems just a bit, and then you move teams the next year and you're trying to get that cash there and you off you go, you're batting number three for Bangalore. That sort of stuff has never really excited me. 
Um, yeah, I, I don't know. It's yeah, I think it can be a little bit selfish the IPL and, and the way you probably go about your cricket. Great, I think you can make great gains as a cricketer, and you learn so much being involved in a competition like that. And I would have loved the opportunity, but I've enjoyed my time with New Zealand and and ND and pretty content with with where I'm at in life. At what point did that um, Black Caps goal kind of come into your head? Because you, you were born in South Africa, you grew up in South Africa. At what point did you kind of mentally make that switch to be, yeah, I want to be a Black Cap? I actually probably made it before we moved over. So mum uh-huh. told me we were moving over in 1995, so we had the World Cup, the Rugby World Cup um, in South Africa. And I was going to school supporting the All Blacks because I was moving to New Zealand, so I was going to try to be cool and yeah different journal i was just running through everyone anyway i was like they can't lose i'm just i'm I'm going for it here and from then i started supporting new zealand um whether i actually meant it or not i'm not 100 percent sure um but i was all over new zealand and the all blacks and winning that comp and i actually cried when they lost that that bloody final (laughs) and dropped goals and penalties and how boring it was but they yeah and so i went to school the next day and i got slated um but so it was around that point when we moved over i was ready to to make my allegiance to, to new zealand and i think throughout the years it potentially flipped to and fro um by the time i was 17 i reckon mm. that was it started playing free and d there's these sort of new zealand um sides getting picked for under 17s and the 19s and and i wanted to be somewhere involved in that and yeah, I reckon 17 at the mm. awesome. peak. Last one for me, BJ. This has been awesome, by the way. Thanks so much for your time. What's next? I'm hearing whispers that there might be a bit of academy coaching on the side. Is is coaching the, the path that you're looking to go down? Yep, yep, yep. Um, I've had to write a CV and try to chuck a cover letter together and, and hopefully, um, yeah, hopefully get an interview for one of the academy roles around here, around the Waikato region. But that's, yeah, that's, I, I'd love to stay in the game. I love the game. I love thinking about the game. Um, whether I'm any good at it, I have no idea. Um, there's, I've obviously kind of starting from scratch. I've done little bits and pieces of coaching, and but I would love to try and share my experience and I enjoy helping people and see if we can make some gains with some of the imagine bj watling cv turning up <laughs> and you're in- i was talking to my wife and i was like this what the hell can we put in this there's nothing i can put in this it's like shit i should have done some study so hang on a minute so you were one of the best test yeah. new zealand test players of all time right i wonder what to put on this nd cv all i've got is bj watling yeah just put that in yeah I- <laughs> <laughs> I found it quite tough to fill that page. It's so. like we make light of it, but it is it is an interesting thing for you having spent your whole adult life as a professional athlete, right? That you do. You kind of and we spoke about this with, with Dwayne Sweeney and he was kind of came away from it, was a little bit off mic, but thinking, Well shit, what do I do now? I haven't done, done it. I've only I've only ever done sport, but the skills that you actually acquire during your sporting career hold you in great stead in the real world. And I'm sure you'll find something to go to. Uh, microphone behind the behind the mic doing a little bit of commentary. Is that that's kind of a a well walked path? Hard no. Really? Oh, hard no. I, I'm happy to do interviews and, and have some chats and answer a few questions, but I certainly won't be stepping in front of the mic going, "Yep, yeah, I'm going to tell this story about what's happening out there now." Because nah, not my cup of tea. Not my cup of tea. Is there ever um, umpiring? You ever thought about? It, it, it's crossed my mind, but then, but then standing in the field for five days, I've just yeah. I may as well keep playing. Yeah. Crazy, to be honest. I may as well. At least you got better money. To start with, but yeah, hum, I've got a new job. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to travel the world again, like and I'm going to stand there for five days. And there's, there's no breaks. You, you're not. It's not like you bowl a team out and wait to bat. It's like you're back out there. Yeah. Um, nah, nah. Mm. Tough job, umpiring, especially with the, the players these days. They're, they're never happy. Yeah. Even well, with replays showing it's out all the time. It's a hard no behind the mic for commentary, but you have delivered tonight. That has been so good. Um, so good. Listeners are going to love it. Uh, Shay, last words? No, nothing. Thank you very much for, for taking time out. All the best with your next endeavours. And uh, I'll timestamp it, but we'll catch you on Friday night at the Hamilton Boys High Foundation dinner.
Perfect. Cheers, lads. Been been a pleasure. Cheers. Hey guys. Thanks for listening. If you've made it to the end, hopefully that means you've enjoyed the episode. If that's the case and you feel strongly enough about it to share on social media, we'd greatly appreciate it. It's the quickest and easiest way to help the podcast grow. Thanks for tuning in.